This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers, and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. What is up, everybody? Jeremy here. It is Tuesday. It is the 3rd of May, 2022, and this is your Create Your Own Life show. Hope you guys are having a great start to May uh, as we are counting down to my 35th birthday now. Man, I'm getting old here uh, in the month of May, and a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pike as well. I know we've been working on renovating our offices the last week or so, so I was learning how to install windows and uh, you know, not Microsoft Windows, but actually like real physical windows and putting them in the wall and things like that. So uh, that's been kind of fun and interesting and, and a lot of great stuff happening over there. I also just went to a wedding, which was kind of weird um, in a post-COVID world. Well, that's my like, I think only second wedding um, per post-COVID and um, first since they kind of dropped all the mask bullshit and everything, which has been kind of nice. So it was nice to get out, see some people and... Um, experience something that is 100% totally normal. Um, so it was great to, to do that. It was a friend I haven't seen in a bit, so it was nice to see him and uh, you know wishing them the best as well. So we also have uh, my new book, which is coming out on June 21st, which is called Unremarkable to Extraordinary. It is based on everything I've learned from some of the incredible guests we've had on this show over the years. And it really is a playbook on how you can you know, reach your extraordinary, which is quite exciting. Um, and we have some cool pre-offers to the book um, where you can actually you head over to getextraordinarybook.com right now and uh, pre-order the book or order the book there, depending on when you're hearing this. We will uh, send you a free version of the audio book as well as our guide of 30 days to extraordinary, which is going to be super exciting as well. So that's GetExtraordinaryBook.com. Help us support the launch. June 21st is coming your way. You know, a few of you ordered a few years ago. Um, this has been definitely a process. I've learned a lot. Um, I've written two books as I've written the first one, tore it up, rewrote it, and wrote a new one. Um, that's one of the reasons this took so long. But I'm really excited for, for kind of where we are with this whole thing now and, and excited to share it with you guys as well. And I'm excited for today's guest, actually. Um, he's an author as well, and, and he has a book which is coming out in the next couple weeks, which I'm super excited about. Uh, our guest today is Kamal Gupta, and uh, he has a book coming out called Play It Right, The Remarkable Story of a Gambler Who Beat the Odds on Wall Street. This was a really great conversation. He has a pretty unique background, um, being somebody that's always been interested and worked in computers, um, You know, starting out in India coming to Vegas to actually play blackjack, which surprised me because I feel like everybody, it's always poker, right? And, and I actually slipped a couple times and he corrected me there because I feel like I always fall back into the poker thing. Blackjack, he looked at a lot of the rules he, he, uh, he learned there and he said, well, these can be applied to the financial market. So he actually took that and I think it was like 103 months, whatever, having a losing month in financial markets. And he kind of showed how that can be. So we have a really interesting conversation um, about how he was able to consistently make money doing that, but also at the same time, how he started looking at the ethics of the financial world. So we talk a lot about that, a lot about some of the premonitions he was having before things got crazy in 2008 and why he moved on. Also some reflections on where the economy is going and you know what should really be done about a lot of what we're dealing with right now. This is a really, really insightful conversation. We, we cover a lot of different things, so I think you guys are, are really going to enjoy this one. Before we get into this episode, though, I want to give a shout out to a couple companies that made this episode possible. To our friends over at MyPillow, who right now can give, will give you up to 66% off of select products. If you use my promo code, which is CYOL over at MyPillow.com, up to 66% off of select products. Um, I just got over a little bit of a cold, and uh, man, I was hugging that my pillow a lot more, and it helped me to feel better faster. So if you too want to feel better faster, grab your my pillow. Um, promo code C Y O L. All right, uh, and also shout out to our friends over at Audible. 
um, who right now are offering you a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. Uh, right now, I am reading um, Don't Burn This Country by previous CYOL guest Dave Rubin, who actually is coming back on the show next week to talk about this very book. So if you want to grab that book or any other book for free, courtesy of Audible, just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. Also, do not forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we are on YouTube. We are on Rumble. We are on Apple Podcasts. And uh, wherever you're seeing us, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Leave us a comment. Leave us a review. Whatever it is, support the show and help us to get out there and reach more people. All right. Without further ado, let's get into this interview with Kamal Gupta. Everybody, Jeremy here, and guys, I'm I'm very excited for the episode we have for you today. As we have Kamal Gupta with us today, and we're going to be taking a look at you know not only his interesting background, coming from India, being a professional poker player, uh, investing for over a hundred months without a down month, which is also very interesting. But we're also going to take a look at a lot of the financial ramifications out there as well. So, Kamal, thank you so much for for hanging out with me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I, I wanted to, to kind of start out for, for you first is, you know, you're originally from India. And one of the things we were, we were speaking about is you actually had arthritis at a, a very young age and you've had all the success despite that. You mentioned that starting at 15. And I'm interested to find out, you know, because of that, did that change the things you were looking at growing up in terms of like what you were looking to do? Actually, that's a great question because... I think my success is probably not despite my arthritis, but maybe partly because of it. Mm. Because, I mean, I I started having physical pain at age 15, which, you know, by the time I was 18 or 19, had spread to virtually every joint in my body. Oh, my gosh. At this, I mean, now that I'm 57 years old, my neck basically is frozen solid for the last 25 odd years or so. And um, the thing is, when you have physical pain at such a an early age, and you're told, and it was diagnosed when I was almost 18 or 19 years old, because it took you doctors years to figure out that a 15 year old could have arthritis. And when I finally got the sentence that I would suffer from physical pain for the rest of my life, I mean, it was never going to go away. I mean, you can take pills, but those pills have side effects sometimes that are worse yeah. than the pain. So it was a very difficult problem to deal with for an 18 year old. And I decided at a very early age that it was not going to slow me down. Yes, physical changes happen and there's some things that I will not be able to do um, as time goes on. But if I want to do something, I'm going to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. So as a result of arthritis, I became mentally a lot tougher than I would have been otherwise. And I think without that mental toughness, I could not have survived, you know, in casinos, could not certainly could not have survived in Wall Street. And even with that toughness, it was a very difficult, you know, road. Mm -hmm. But so, I mean, my Kids once asked me, do I wish I, I never had arthritis because I've been in physical pain for like 40 odd years of my life. And I tell them, no, I, I don't wish that I, didn't, I never had it because it made me who I am and I'm happy with how things eventually turned out. Well, I, th I so, think that's a really interesting viewpoint, Kamal. And the reason so I had had a conversation uh, a, a bit ago about, you know, you look at like the World War II generation, right? You know, called the greatest generation because they had to, you know, live through a war and, you know, their parents had just lived through you know, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression and a lot of these things. And a lot of that adversity, like, it creates something in us that I think, frankly, a lot of people are lacking now because they've, they've had things easy. They've, you know, can order things online and get them quickly. They've never had to, to struggle and, and really work for something. And I think that creates a, a kind of grit in somebody. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, certainly in my case, you know, difficulties at, an, at a young age made me a lot tougher. And I think today the struggles, and I see this with my kids, you know, are of a different nature. But sure. I mean, I think struggle is is just unavoidable. And it, I think, I think if you are successful, it's much more satisfying after you've struggled to achieve that success than if you just bought a lottery ticket and won some money. You know, there's clearly no skill involved in that. But there's certain skill involved in going through a struggle and overcoming the odds and beating them and being successful at the end. It's far more satisfying. I mean, for me, whenever I went to the casinos and I got into a winning streak and won a lot of money, it really didn't feel as good as when I endured a horrible losing streak and then came back from it and had the mental fortitude to deal with it mm -hmm. and then came out ahead. 
So when did you start playing poker? Like, what got you interested in that? It was whole blackjack. World? I played blackjack. I actually never played poker. Oh, I'm sorry, blackjack. I, I, blackjack. I, my my because my brain is kind of crossed up here because your when your publicist reached out to me, um, we had in, had uh, Maria Konnikova on the show not long ago about oh. about poker, and she goes, "Oh, if you like Maria, of course you're gonna love Kamal." Um, but yes, blackjack. Go ahead. <laughs> well, so I played blackjack, and actually, there's a very good reason why until 2018, when I'm like well into my 50s, that I did not play poker because. When I'm 20 some years old, to me, part of the motivation, apart from the whole mathematical challenge of of blackjack, was the fact that, you know, casinos threw card counters out, which a fate that I've suffered, you know, several times myself. And that really offended me because I felt Mm -hmm. it was really unfair that someone who uses their brain to play the game, according to the rules the casinos have set up, you know, for any player, that they can pick and choose who their clients are. So if you have the audacity to use your brain and count cards while sitting at the blackjack table, they'll kick you out. Well, you're, and, you're a risk so, for them, though, because the house always wants to win. <laughs> right. But the thing is, they, they not only do they always want to win, they also want to win from every player. Like, mm-hmm. They don't mind if a player gets lucky, because luck will even out. But they don't, they're not willing to lose any money to any player on the basis of their skill. Which is why I didn't play poker, because poker is an extremely skillful you know, profession. Mm-hmm. But the problem with poker is because the house takes a cut from every pot, the house can never lose in poker. Mm. So, And I was after the house's money. And if you, I, I don't know how much time you've spent in casinos, but if you go and spend time I, I haven't spent league, much. I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't see myself as a very lucky like gambling person. I'm, I'm not good at well, it. It's, <laughs> casinos, I mean, I spent two and a half years of my life in casinos. And yeah. And they're a singularly depressing place. And the reason being, apart from the occasional cheers of people winning money, by and large, people are going to lose, right? The whole mm-hmm. edifice is standing because of, you know, paid for by people's losses. Mm-hmm. And if you look around the poker table, and I, I, I went and did this, I mean, same is true for blackjack or any other game. I mean, people are not happy in a casino. I mean, how can you be if, you know, over the long run, you're going to lose? And yes, there are periods of euphoria, which is what keep you going. Um, but so to me, it was, you know, it was a moral battle against the casinos, even more than the mathematical and the financial one, because uh, and which is why I didn't play poker, because poker is e- easily, you know, as mathematically com- complex and more intellectually challenging than blackjack is, because blackjack mm-hmm. is actually can be solved with the aid of a computer, which is much harder to do in a poker uh, for poker. And I eventually did become interested in the intellectual challenge of poker, but that was much, much later. But at the time, for me, what motivated me was the fact that uh, the game was about math and casinos were, I thought, evil. And mm. they needed to be, I mean, I was going to teach them a lesson in my own small way. That, that's a really interesting viewpoint, by the way, because if you look at like things you've done in your career, you, you've kind of taught a lot of people a lesson, even with, with what you've done in, in blackjack, but also in the investing world, right? Like you figured out kind of like, the, the whole formula behind how to make it go, but at the same time you look at it and you're like, well, is this is this whole world um, that I'm operating in, is this a, a moral world? That's certainly true. I mean, there are two components to playing it right, right? One is the whole methodology aspect of it, and then there's the whole moral aspect of it. And so first about the methodology of it, um, when I ended up on Wall Street, and, and chapter one of the book uh, recounts the story of how I ended up in this business, which was you know, purely accidental, because when I first came to America, I had taken a vow that I would never work on Wall Street. I mean, to me, greed was evil, and, you know, and I didn't want any part of this industry. But somehow I ended up, you know, breaking that vow and a few others that I made. And um, to me, the only reason I played blackjack is because it could be mathematically proven that the player has an edge in the game. Mm. Now, when I came to, and that was, you can read that in books. Like I sure. used a book called Million Dollar Blackjack back in Houston, which was to me the Bible for blackjack. Uh, but then when I came to Wall Street, there are no books you can read that will teach you how to beat the markets. And so I knew I would have to start from first principles. <laughs> no one would publish them because they'd be too no afraid would, of their, exactly. investor, their right. investors losing money. <laughs> right. And, it, and it's, a, it's an intractable problem. I mean, how mm-hmm. do you beat financial markets? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, they're so complex. I mean, they're not confined to a 52 card deck. I mean, where the probabilities can be can be figured out. Um, and it's an infinite problem. So I, it took me seven years to figure out how to play this game. I mean, and people often ask me, you know, how did you have the wherewithal to stay with it for seven years? And it wasn't that easy. I mean, after two years, 
I actually left the business for three and a half months because I was just fed up with it, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I came back with a newfound resolve that I'm going to figure out a method. Took me another five years to figure it out. And then the whole, per it's because I came from a blackjack background that I wanted, I would not play the game unless I could prove to myself that I had a mathematical advantage in it. Now, it doesn't mm. have to be a large mathematical advantage. Like in blackjack, a 1% um, advantage over the house will give you like, you know, a few hundred percent a year return annually. Well, you, you look at professional baseball players, right? Like, you know, there, there's, right. there's different levels of, of the minors, right? And, you know, like somebody might be half a percentage better than somebody else, but, you know, that could be a mile and a half, you know, a mile and a half, a half an hour on a fastball. Well, that guy becomes automatically a better player. Where if you look at, like, um, you know, uh, Araldus Chapman right now, who's the closer for the Yankees, and when he came into the majors, he was throwing 105 miles an hour. Now, at, at age 34, he's barely touching 94, and guys are tattooing the ball. So, like, it, it doesn't take much to, to make that change, like you're saying. You're right. It doesn't take much. And a small edge can be magnified by playing the game over and over again, and in, in the case of the hedge fund world, by using leverage to amplify the gains. So a small advantage of a quarter percent or a half a percent, as long as it's mathematically provable and repeatable over time, mm -hmm. um, can translate into you know high returns. And that's what I focused on. So I worked on I worked in the U.S. mortgage market, which was you know largely responsible for the 2008 crisis. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah, thank, thanks to bundling and, and toxic assets and all those fun things. Right. <laughs> so, but I what I did in that market was to narrow down. Like it's like going into a casino and being confronted with like a hundred games, you know. But I pick pick one game, which is blackjack, and one method, which is counting cards, and mm -hmm. I only do that, and I stick to that for as long as I as I play the game. And for the whole time I was in the casinos, I never played any other game. Mm. And the same thing is true for my twenty twenty seven years on Wall Street. I mean, the first seven years were figuring out a method. The next twenty years were basically playing the game. Um, and I mean, it's hard to believe, but you know, I never deviated from the method for even once in those 20 years. Wow. And a potential investor one asked me, like, don't you get bored doing the same thing over and over again? And I tried to explain to them, like, an investment methodology is just a framework. You know, just like if Roger Federer is playing tennis, the dimensions of the court, which is 78 by 27 feet, is the framework. No one would ask Roger Federer if he's bored of playing in that field every single day for the last 20, 30 years of his life. Yeah, like like Every, the the idea of of winning and working towards winning, like that can be an incredible feeling, and sometimes even that exactly. losing can motivate you to winning. That too, and and every tennis match is going to be like no other tennis match. Every match is different. Every trading day is different. You know, every hand in blackjack is different. I mean, it every that's enough to keep you going. Like you said, the whole struggle, the the idea of beating the markets or the house. And, you know, and you've just set the, 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 the framework. It's just the guardrails you've set for yourself that you're not going to play anything other than blackjack and you'll only count cards. So I'm only going to play in this one arena of the mortgage market and I'm never going to deviate from it. So that was the first aspect about the methodology, which took me seven years to figure out. And then, you know, I didn't know it when I went to work for hedge funds that it would lead to a very long streak, like 103 months of positive returns, which is unheard of. But... You know, I was determined that I was going to play in a play, play the game in the financial markets in a blackjack fashion, or I was not going to play it because, mm. if, like, I wasn't doing it for the money. I mean, yes, you have to make money to prove that you're winning, but sure. money is the side effect of a game played well, not the primary objective. And then, so even beyond the methodology part of it, then there is the whole moral and ethical dilemma that you are constantly faced with, and I had two big ones that I confronted. One that has run throughout my career, which is take more risk because you'll make more money for the firm and you'll get paid more money. Did which, you have you like know, a, was, like a, a, something like risk tolerance wise you set up for yourself? Like, did you have like personal, like, okay, this is kind of as far as I'll take it. Or, or how did you decide like what was a, a calculated risk for yourself? Um, I decided that um, it was very much like how I played blackjack. Um, mm -hmm. There is, there are rules and methods that you can follow in blackjack, which uh, give you a f only a five percent chance of losing your bankroll, mm. and before and a ninety-five percent probability of doubling it. I mean, wow. if, if you're playing the game, either you'll lose it all or you'll double it, right? So I was comfortable with the ninety-five-five ratio, 
that there's a 95% chance I'll double the bankroll and only a 5% chance that I'll lose it all. Mm. Um, and obviously 5% is a low probability. It never happened to me, you know. And so I followed the same script on Wall Street that I wanted to make sure that I managed and that 95.5 is a risk management strategy about how you size your bets. And as long as your bets are small versus your bankroll, the probability of ruin goes down. Mm. But so does your profit potential as well. I mean, the larger your bets, the more money you'll make and the faster you'll lose it. But I didn't care about how much money I could make. I wanted to play the game for as long as possible. So what was important to me is that my probability of ruin or losing it all be next to zero. Mm. So that's how I managed risk uh, in financial markets as well, which, by the way, is a contradiction, you know, compared to everyone else in, that I knew on Wall Street, you know, at investment banks, at hedge funds, everyone constantly tries to make the most amount of money they can in the shortest amount of time they, that they can do it. And is that just greed or is it satisfying investors or, or what causes that too? Because like at the same time, think, you have to realize there's ruin there. I can think of two reasons. One, like you said, is just greed, you know, because people want more money and the game is not that important. And there is one other, I think, a subtle reason, which, you know, it's possible that people don't even realize it themselves who are doing this, that if you think the odds are not with you, you should put it all on red or black and just one hand. And, and just walk away, whatever happens. Because the longer you play the game, the greater the probability of you losing it all. Sure. If the odds are with the casino or with the markets. So if you feel like you have an edge, like I obviously believed it, you'll play the game in a very risk controlled fashion because the longer you play the game, the more, the, the greater the probability that the true odds will be realized and you'll come out ahead. Mm -hmm. But if the odds are not with you, if that's what you feel, you will have to take, you should take rightfully, as much risk as possible, as quickly as possible to, you know, hit it big, if you can, because there's mm -hmm. a lottery effect in the whole trader option on Wall Street, where you, if you take a lot of risk, and it works out, you get paid a lot of money, if you take a lot of risk, and you blow up, well, you get fired, but you don't lose anything, you know, and you go get another job. And because in some cases, a great loss suffered by a trader makes him more attractive to the next company, because he's going to hit at some well, point. Exactly. Like the ball mm -hmm. landed on red the previous time around. Next time it'll hit black. So um, I think this is <laughs> Wall Street is the only industry that I know of where gigantic failure, I mean, and catastrophic losses, I mean, and we've seen this over and over again, do not end careers. It, it's kind of wild, too, though, because you, you like and, and I'm only going off of like, you know, what you're saying here and what I've seen, like to me, emotionally, that's got to be tough man like the the roller coaster of that like what your day is you know you got to be like a caffeine fiend like everything else to like kind of make that go yeah caffeine during the day alcohol at night it, it and that's like <laughs> not that's not good for like you know raising a family and like living a normal life and like that can be really hard i imagine well that's actually a great point because i actually say this in the book that i had figured it out in las vegas that the key to happiness and eventually Life is a struggle for happiness, right? That's what everyone's looking for. It's not money. Sure. It's not, you know, it's, you want to be happy. And I had figured out, at least for me, and I mean, I suspect this is true for most people, but it's certainly true for me, that the key to happiness is playing the game well during the day and sleeping well at night. Mm -hmm. And now, on the surface, it sounds like a very simple statement, play the game during the, well during the day and sleep well at night. But then there's a whole lot of moral ethical ramifications to being able to sleep well at night. And, yeah. And the sleeping well at night is also has a component to you know how much risk you take. Because I made sure the amount of risk I took on Wall Street, never my trades never kept me up at night and waking me up at two o'clock in the morning to see where prices were in Tokyo and you know Hong Kong and which has happened to a lot of people in this industry. People wake how up do in you, the night because how do you balance that then too? Because you know I'm I'm sure there's um, you know there's investors that um, you know, they make an investment to make a whole lot of money, but at the same time, like it could hurt somebody, right? Like you look at, you know, um, things that were happening, like with, with GameStop and with AMC and all these different things out there, there was a lot of, you know, big movement, but in the end, somebody gets hurt, I guess, as an investor, like, how do you balance that moral aspect of it? Well, the thing, um, that's a tough one because for me, uh, believe it or not, the whole investment methodology that I followed was a search for fairness. In markets mm. uh, because my whole 
playing of blackjack was, I mean, apart from the whole math of it, was a crusade against the casinos because when I found out that they sometimes they not only kick you out, but they might get you arrested or have you beaten. So to me, um, it was like a moral cause in financial markets as well. And my investment methodology is called relative value, which is a search for fairness, this time between the prices of various bonds. Mm. So in, I don't think I'm making the world a better place, but I'm certainly making the bond market a slightly fairer place with my actions. So I only sell bonds that are unfairly high in price and buy ones that are unfairly low in price and try to inject a measure of fairness in their relative prices. Now, in terms of the greater consequences of um, what the ramifications of those actions are, that's a tough one because yeah. I think my little, my domain was very small. Like, I mean, yes, I worked for very large hedge funds, but I worked in a small niche market, you know, sure. following a certain method. Um, and I just tried to do, I tried to just play it right and hope that, you know, um, everything comes out as a result of that. And in, in, in my case, I think the final result of that is this book, Play It Right, which, I mean, hopefully people will read it. And they, you know, and the book would not have existed if I hadn't followed a certain path. Mm. And there is a chance that maybe, you know, people can take a lesson or two away from it. Well, I, I, I want to kind of take our, our uh, I guess, our microscope and kind of go backwards now. We're going to we're going to kind of uh, demagnify a little bit here. And I want to look at kind of the, the broader financial you know aspect of things. And, um, you know, when we're looking at kind of the, the investment industry as a whole. Right. Like we look at, you know, if you're in a casino. Right. You win or you lose. Right. Like you get the money, you keep the money. Like one of the things where we've seen, especially since 2008, is you win the money, you lose the money. But if you're important enough, we'll back you up with more money so that, you know, like, you know, maybe you'll make bad bets in the future. But, hey, we got your back. We're the American government, whatever it might be. So I guess like looking at that, like, like, how does that whole like it's not even crony capitalism. I don't even know how to describe it. Like, how does that whole aspect, how do you kind of morally balance out that whole aspect? That's the, that's really tough because I think this whole concept of moral hazard only exists for individuals and not for corporations. And the bigger the corporation, the less moral hazard it suffers. And mm-hmm. we, I mean, I watched it in great frustration what happened in 2008 um, as Wall Street gets bailed out, you know. And, and I have a few chapters on the crisis and I sort of, I was at the epicenter of the crisis, I believe, in 2000. Mm-hmm. You know, I was working for a large Swiss bank and in fall of 2004, I mean, which is very early, well, sure. many years before the crisis, and it's boom time on Wall Street. Yeah, it's when the real estate market I, was still out of control. Like it, it was, was like, it and, was, I, and, I, yeah. and in the fall of 2004, and the story is in the book, I become convinced that the largest of Swiss banks is a ticking time bomb. Mm. And I used to come home every night and tell my wife, I have to get out, I have to get out. This place could blow sky high any day. And, and I, I was so scared of believing this way that I only told one or two friends and they all thought I was insane. I mean, this is the most prestigious of Swiss banks, you know, 150 odd billion in market capitalization and you're calling it, you know, a ticking time bomb in a house of cards. But I felt strongly enough that that was the case that in very early 2005, and it took me six months to find a job because I wanted to leave, you know, because I felt yeah. like I was on the Titanic and I had to get out <laughs> um, before it sank. And so I go and find a job at like the opposite of a large Swiss bank, which is a small British hedge fund, which was not involved in any kind of credit related CDOs or subprime, and, you know. Sure. And I go hide there, you know, hoping that the storm will, you know, I can ride out the storm at in this lifeboat. And, and the storm hit a couple of years later. Uh, in 2007, um, you know, two years after I left the Swiss bank, you know, it all imploded. And by 2008, you know, the company had lost well over $100 billion in its market cap. And if it wasn't for the Swiss bank and the US Federal Reserve, the company's, you know, name would be consigned to the pages of history, you know. it's, And so that's the frustrating part for me is because I saw the risk taking firsthand like my approach to the markets was to take as little risk as I could, mm-hmm. you know, to minimize my chance of ruin. Whereas everyone around me was doing the exact opposite. And soon as I, I mean, it took me five years to figure this out while, because I was very happy doing what I was doing. And, and I never really, you know, picked myself up and looked around like what's going on around me. And, and, and 
you know, after five years of being at the firm, I finally did. And I was horrified by what I saw. And I left, you know, shortly thereafter, shortly being three to six months. Um, but in, in ample time before the crisis hit. Mm-hmm. And so that was the difficult part for me because I saw, I mean, it was very obvious to me that this firm is going to collapse. Yeah. But I had no way of knowing that this was a problem that, made, problem that was endemic to the entire industry. And that came as a real shock to me over the next year or two. So, um, so one of the things about that I think is is tough, right? Like, like, and I want, this is why I, I think your 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 background as a, as a, a blackjack player is so interesting because it goes kind of so well with inter- like you can learn a lot from gambling that you can bring to investing, but at the same time they're not the same anymore because people lose their money and it gets paid off by somebody else. And that's just not how it works, right? right. If you lose your money, you got to figure it out. And, and, and the, the thing I really wrestle with Kamal, and this is, this is something I, I look at this and it, it concerns me, right? You look at, you know, what happened in eight, we had uh, 2008, we had the, 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 the TARP uh, bailouts where we had, um, you know, we had the, the federal reserve printing money, which means that everybody else's dollar is now worth more because these guys made bad investments. So the thing, the thing I look at, and this is what I struggle with, is investors, do they make a, you know, you weren't thinking this way, obviously, you were looking at it a little bit differently, but a lot of investors, do they make the decision, well, okay, I'm going to invest in this, and if it doesn't go well, well, you know, there's still kind of a, a golden parachute out there to save me. Do they have to be allowed to fail in order to fix it, but letting them fail, does that do a lot of damage too? Like, that's the, the struggle of it. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think you have to take the, the bitter pill when companies fail. And, mm-hmm. and if, you, if you go back to pre-2008 days and the IMF and the U.S. government, whenever they went to developing countries, which is where I hailed from, right? mm-hmm. whenever their, the mantra was you have to let failing institutions fail and eventually you'll be stronger as a result of it. Mm-hmm. But then when it came to America's turn and facing with failing institutions failing, they were not willing to let them go under and talk about systemic risk and all that stuff. And, and obviously created a huge, huge moral hazard in the financial industry. And if anything, it's far worse today than it was in 2008 or 2007, yeah. because if you look at the large behemoths, the number, the consolidation of the financial industry has only gotten worse since the crisis, during the crisis and after. And the balance sheet of these companies, which basically brought them down, the amount of risk they had. I mean, risk and balance sheet are often interchangeable. I mean, the larger your balance sheet, the more risk you're carrying on your books. Sure. Um, you can look at any of these large financial companies. Their balance sheets are considerably larger today than they were in 2007. So, I mean, the risk is, and the moral hazard is much greater today. And I hate to say this, but I have no doubt that they will again get bailed out if something bad happens. But I would not want to use that as an investment strategy. I mean, under no circumstances, because A, I think it's, morally wrong Mm -hmm. and b i don't want to have my trade or my investments be backstopped by the u.s government just in case something goes wrong it's such a hard moral argument because you're right like you know if if my business doesn't do well and i can't make payroll and i can't pay off my debtors i'm out of business right that's how it works like it it, it's kind of you you win some you lose some and you you hope you hope you, you make the better decisions but I think to to not have that in the financial world, like it's a huge ramification like you're talking about, and it's part of the reason like inflation is just out of control right now. I think uh, uh, the stats different now, but when I was looking at it last year, it was May of last year, forty percent of the dollars currently inflation or currently uh, in in use were were printed, you know, between January and May of last year, which was wild. So it can, this problem's getting worse and worse and worse, and we at some point we can't print more money, man. Like at, at some point the well, party's that's... over. You're right. And, and, and I think a lot of the blame for that has to be placed at the door of, doorstep of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Like the la- from what I can recall, the last time a chairman of the Federal Reserve made some, a statement that was even mildly negative about the stock market was back in 1996 when Greenspan said irrational exuberance. And he got slammed like there was no tomorrow that he retreated. And then Greenspan's irrational exuberance became the Greenspan put, which is that every time markets hit a turbulent spot, Greenspan was, will be there to bail them out. Uh, and that continued with Bernanke and, and so on. Um, and it's, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, and I think um, the financial industry, I mean, which I don't think would exist without the Federal Reserve, mm-hmm. um, because that's, 
basically the, the, the whole concept of the U.S. dollar and the strength and the you know, credit worthiness of the country. The Federal Reserve has a lot to do with it. But the problem is the Federal Reserve has thrown its lot with the S&P 500. And mm -hmm. they measure success and failure by the price of where you know, stocks are trading instead of where the re real economy is, like things like inflation and prices and unemployment and you know, the crisis in the, in the heartland, whether it relates to opioid or job losses. I mean, when was the last time you heard a Federal Reserve chairman talk about, you know, job losses due to outsourcing to China, mm -hmm. India and Mexico? Almost well, never. You, you look at even, you know, like how, how, how presidents discuss the economy. Like, yeah, the stock right. market being at 30,000 looks good. But like, hey, man, I, I have friends that can't pay their bills. Like it's it's the economy right. isn't good. Well, the thing is, because the Federal Reserve, I mean, because it's in... I hate to use the word capture, but I can't think of any other word. It's captured by big business. Mm -hmm. And so is the entire political system. And which is why I think, like, we can just go back to 2008, you know. All these fin failing financial companies got equity infusion, right? They got 25, 30 billion each or something like that to prop them. Whereas individuals got a slightly lower mortgage rate. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they get twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 each to pay, pay off their part of their mortgage? Yeah. Because, you know, the moral hazard is equally, I mean, if not more so, worse for a financial institution than it is for a homeowner who bought a whole overpriced house. Well, you bought overpriced CDOs and subprimes, and now you should pay the price. But clearly, the, the financial institution was not willing to let them pay the price. And it just so happens that the ex-CEO of Goldman Sachs was the Treasury Secretary when the crisis hit. So, uh, I mean, and I think the problem with the, the reason I believe the Federal Reserve and the US government, you know, is has this corporate capture. A big component of that is the revolving door between corporations yes. and the government. These guys need like NASCAR jackets, man. Like they, they can they can have right. all the people they're sponsored by or who they've worked for or whatever. Like it's 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 a real problem because they're gonna take care of their friends, they're gonna wanna make sure they get a job when they get out, or you know, you look at even somebody like like Janet Yellen, right? Um, yes. you know, she was Treasury Board and Federal Reserve. She's done both. And you know, well, and actually, at the same time she got speaking that. gigs all over the place from all these places too. Exactly. Right. Well, she, I think, stopped being the Federal Reserve Chairman in 2018 mm -hmm. and became the Treasury Secretary in 2020, 2020 right, mm -hmm. or 2021, in the beginning of 2021. Um, in between those two years, 2019 and 2020, she collected over $7 million in speaking fees, yep. out of which $1 million came from Citigroup alone. So, I mean, like Ben Bernanke, when he left the Federal Reserve, he used to get paid $250,000 a night for a dinner with you know presumably wealthy investors i mean how many people can afford that yeah um so and i question, imagine it was probably a great restaurant too so he got he got a really yeah, good I'm free sure. meal <laughs> so he got 251,000 you know so um the thing is so the question you i mean one has to ask and mm -hmm. and i may not have the answer to this but the question is who is the federal reserve chairman serving while they're in office the yeah. the taxpayer who pays them 203,000 dollars and 500 a year or investors that paid them more in one night mhm mm and that is the dilemma. And that's, you know, I mean, there have to be rules against cashing out on your public service, you know, the way is constantly done. Like mm -hmm. either, so to me, public service has either become um, a down payment on collecting money after you leave, as mm -hmm. in Bernanke's case, or as in Hank Paulson's case, you get a tax write-off because you're a CEO of Goldman Sachs, who when you go and work for the government, you get some massive tax write-off on your stock market gains. So, it's it's wild to think about it because I think the more we look at these problems, the more we look at, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the to the, the blackjack analogy, right? Like, you win or you lose, right? Like, and you got to figure out how to do it better, or you got to figure out to move on. Though, yeah. And and they're just really in the financial world now. Um, it's changed a lot. Like that isn't something that can happen. And, and I, frankly, I don't know how to solve that. And it kind of worries me for the world that that my children are walking into because, you know, like playing it right is, is not just winning the game, but it's also like winning in an ethical way, which sometimes means not winning as big or not winning at all. Right. And and I think the focus. I mean, the focus on the game is just not there. It's it's like. You know, Wall Street's race on the etra is just, you know, to make as much money as possible as quickly as possible. And, and, and I don't know how do you change that culture. And I think I really was hoping when 2008 hit that financial industries like big paydays of the past would be a matter of the past.
mm-hmm. and like the pay would be capped at like some low number for the next few years because large paychecks have basically doomed this industry, which had in 2007 and 2008. I mean, the sure. five years before that. And um, but that didn't happen. And I really believe that if you had if somehow, you know, compensation had been curtailed in the crisis to just pay back for the losses that these companies had incurred, maybe you would have a different situation. But that didn't happen. Companies got bailed out. The U.S. government was clearly in their corner. Um, and today, I think the situation is uh, far more extreme than it was in 2007, 2008. I mean, it, and by the way, it's not just the financial industry. I mean, you can sure. look at any. Well, no, it's any, businesses any out business. of control. Right. I mean, the auto biz- I mean, I, I don't know if you know this uh, small statistic, but in 1996, there were 8,000 publicly listed companies uh, in America. Today, there are barely 4,000. Wow. But think about it. A quarter century has gone by and the number of publicly listed companies has gone, has been cut by half. I mean, that's not growth. I mean, like, I mean, obviously the GDP in the meantime has grown by easily a factor of two. Well, well you even yeah. look at an, an example people would have, would understand too. Like, just look at like the, the Disney Corporation. Under the Disney Corporation, you have Disney, you have ABC, you have Marvel right. now, you have Star Wars, right. you have Lucasfilm. Like, those were like six or seven, and then there's probably way more than that companies that are now kind of under one banner. Um, and you, you look at this and, you know, Theodore Roosevelt would have been doing some trust busting by now, man. Like, those are right. too many companies I mean, under one banner. It's Right. And, and I hate to use this word, pun, but I was crushed a couple of weeks ago when Microsoft announced they were buying Activision, who's the, you know, who owns Candy Crush, which is a game that I play. Yeah. You know, so, but like, I mean, why? Why? Does well, and they Microsoft own LinkedIn and they own so many different right. things like that company. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. And this lack of competition is like a real problem because cable companies decided not to compete with each other. You know, they've all given each other's turfs. Like, I don't know why in New York State I don't have access to, you know, Cox, for instance, you know. Yeah. Um, And why in my town there is no spectrum or, you know, anything like that. And why am I limited to only one or two options? And same thing with airlines. And airlines are probably the worst of all of these in terms of merger. And the same is true for Boeing. I mean, I think Boeing has is now a conglomeration of a whole bunch of, you know, defense manufacturers and air, airplane, you know, manufacturers, which have now become this this behemoth. And you know, next you have people dying in the seven thirty seven Max, mm-hmm. and it's not none of these these things are not accidents. I mean, these are accidents waiting to happen. Two thousand and eight mm-hmm. was not an accident. It was an accident waiting to happen mm-hmm. uh, because. Because there was a whole system that had been performing in a certain way to make this, you know, um, the system much and more and more unbalanced. And one day it was going to tip over. Well, I, I, I guess looking at that then, right, like, you know, I, and I think, you know, this is one of the concepts you, you, you talk about is there there is always a way to win in every environment. You just have to figure out what it was. And, you know, for you first getting into Wall Street, it took seven years and you had to figure it out. And I guess like looking at the current situation, when like something big we always try to leave our listeners with is the idea that, you know, OK, this is the situation. This is how it is. But something can be done about it. And I guess like looking at it like. What advice would you give people about how to thrive, you know, given the situation we've just talked about? That's really tough. I mean, I can tell you how I have dealt with the problem. Uh, um, and it's it's a somewhat unusual way of dealing with it, because just like I was, I thought casinos were evil. You know, I have a fairly anti-corporate bent as well. Mm-hmm. And the way I have fought this battle for the last 25 years, and which will be possibly the subject or topic for my next book is by helping you know countless people negotiate against their corporate adversaries so Mm. i think what people can do in their own lives is that they can just learn to become better negotiators Mm. and you know and how to deal it's you it you can beat goliath david can beat goliath it's just a question of figuring out how to play the game and you know you you have to be fearless you have to you know Maybe a small amount of greed is okay, but it's it's more about a sustainable game plan of how you live your life. And um, to me, the the most important thing, other than playing the game well, and obviously negotiating is also a game, is to be a, a good negotiator in life. And, mm-hmm. and good negotiator in life is not just in in like any situation. You know, every time there's a financial transaction, there is a negotiate and there's a potential for negotiation. Mm-hmm. So. I think, I mean, my, I go back to my basic principle, which is you 
and it doesn't matter what game you play, but as long as you play the game well during the day and you sleep well at night, I think you'll be happy. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I can't think of anything else because I've known some very wealthy people in my life, mm -hmm. you know, and I can tell you with certainty that beyond a certain amount of wealth, um, I think happiness and um, wealth are not only not correlated, they might be inversely correlated. I mean, a certain amount well, I, I think certain you get to a certain time, point. More money creates more problems, you know. Well, you, you get to a certain point where you have so much of it, it's kind of like, how much do you need? And that's when you kind of look at, okay, well, you know, what good can I do with this, right? Because at the same time, like, you can't just, you know, be like, scrooge mcduck and sit in your piles of cash and slide down them like it, it's you do have to look at like what what good can i do with what i'm creating well that's a good point but even there i would i take some issue with uh this concept of charity that all these you know billion uber billionaires are, are indulging in. i think it's more like a tax write-off for a lot of those guys they're not there doing it because they want to help and, somebody and exactly and also if you had this charitable attitude why didn't you charge a little bit less for your, your products when you were running Microsoft 25 years ago. Sure. Like you could have, if you really were a charitable human being, instead of having the Gates Foundation, why did you not allow more, comp I mean, I was in the computer well, industry. When well, Microsoft that's that's a whole nother bag of worms because the, the Gates Foundation really even shouldn't be a not-for-profit organization because half of it's an investment bank the way it's set up. <laughs> right. I mean, there are, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can argue Apple is a hedge fund as well because they have hundreds of billions in cash. Mm -hmm. The same thing can be said for Harvard University. It's a small university attached to a very large hedge fund. I mean, Harvard's endowment is $53 billion. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, I mean, this is a little known fact, but I'm, that... Harvard's enrollment has stayed constant for the last 30, 40 years, even as U.S. population has gone up by like 50 percent and Harvard's endowment has gone up by a factor of 10. Wow. But then the enrollment has been stuck at 1600 a year. Now, why? I mean, you would think at the very minimum you would want to grow that at the rate of population. Like the college I went to in India, like, I mean, I went to a place called Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. And I looked up these numbers recently. My graduating class was 250 kids in 1985. Mm -hmm. Today, the class is now around 900 kids. So, I mean, that's maybe even beating the rate of population growth. But why? Because I think, I mean, it's for the Harvards of the world. Yes, education is part of it, but it's the branding that is more important. Like, yeah. which is why, I mean, I think some of these high-end retailers burn their expensive bags rather than sell them at a discount because you know you want to protect the brand more than anything else yeah well so kamal I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation man like this uh, i i, I <laughs> was excited but i'm even more excited now that we had it um so i'm really glad your your team reached out and set this up so so the book once again is play it right the remarkable story of a gambler who beat the odds on wall street for people listening um where can they grab the book and where can they you know connect with you uh, my website is kamalguptarights.com. I mean, and it's a shameless uh, copy of Michael Lewis's websites, which is michaellewisrights.com. <laughs> I mean, his book changed my life, so I figured, you know, I would pay homage, homage to, you know, him this way. And the book is uh, going to be for sale, you know, everywhere, including Amazon.com, on May 10th of this year. So you can you can pre-order it now in U.S. and Canada and. And in, it will be available in India and the entire sub, Indian subcontinent on June 18th. Cool. So I have a North American publisher called ECW Press. And in, in India, it's being published by Bloomsbury, which is the publisher for Harry Potter. And cool. um, then also there will be an audiobook, which is coming out on May 24th, being published by um, Tantor Media and being read by a guy with a great voice who read House of Gucci. Awesome. Well, Kamal, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, man. Thank you. It's great to be here.